Hello, it's Scott Lanley here. Today I'm going to do a little science video about how asteroids are discovered. Now, you have probably seen my video about how asteroids have been discovered in the solar system for the last, you know, 30 years or so. And uh, it looks something like this. You have planet Earth, you have the Sun, and then you have dots appearing here, and they go off into all their orbits. Now, people ask me, how are those asteroids being discovered? And some more skeptical people are asking me, hey, you have 600,000 asteroids here. How do we know that this new discovery isn't the same as an older discovery? So let's talk about how all this works. You're on the Earth, you have a telescope. You point it away from the sun because you don't point it at the sun, otherwise you'll burn out your sensor. Um, this takes an image of the sky. The image of the sky will be like a big square and you'll have you know, stars peppering it. You, you know about all these stars because somebody else has cataloged them all. And then you might have a smudge. You might have something that leaves a trail. That is something moving against the background of stars. This is an asteroid, probably. It might be a comet or it might be a planet if you're really bad at this. But uh, it's an asteroid and uh, that's you taking the first photograph of it. Just because you've taken that photo does not mean you have discovered that asteroid. Now, you might go back and take another image saying, hey, this was moving and based on the length of it, it should be here. So you take another image and bang, yeah, you find something there. You have a new set of fixed stars that you know. And so you can draw a line from here to here and say, we have an asteroid. And so you might go back maybe a day later and say, hey, let's take a picture down here. Drawing the line and you get, you know, another observation here. You have three observations. Now, from the Earth's point of view, that's like taking a picture, finding it there, and then the Earth has moved, you take a picture and you find it there, and the Earth has moved and you take a picture and you find it here, and that's a really bad example because asteroids should be moving more slowly than the Earth. And then you can draw a line through these and try to predict the orbit, right? So it typically takes three observations to get the beginnings of an orbit, but three observations are very rarely enough. They're enough to get an approximation. So let's just clean this off and tell you why three is not enough. So this image that you saw me drawing, remember I said that uh, somebody else had gone out and figured out the positions of these stars, right? So when you take an image, the Earth's uh, atmosphere tends to smudge it. So, you know, the stars look more like blobs, right? And, you know, you're not quite sure where the center is, but somebody else has already done it. So although you know you can see this as a blob, you know exactly where that is because people have really figured it out. This asteroid image, well, it's going to be a blob as well. It might be a bit of a stretched out blob. You can approximate where the center is, but since you're the first person to see it, you can't exactly say where it is. And then when you take another image here, say, and you try to draw a line from through this, well, you can draw a line through the center, but equally well and equally valid, you can draw a line which goes from the top to the bottom or a line that goes from the bottom to the top. And so these subtle differences in the orbit are actually quite significant. With three observations, you might, your orbit might start similar and go around, but it might actually be in a completely different orbit. And that's kind of important, especially if you have something that is potentially going to hit the Earth. You kind of want to get your orbit as accurate as possible. So what you do, of course, is you get you know, your third point, which I mentioned, and that limits things a little more, although the, the time difference gets harder to do. And uh, you, know, you can keep on adding these. The more you add, the better you, you get. But more importantly, the longer time you spend observing it, the more accurate you're going to get. Time is actually almost more important than the angular precision because time will tend to differentiate very similar orbits as, uh, well, as time passes. So to go, once you've discovered it and you've got your initial orbit, you get what's called a provisional designation, right? That's where you get a provisional name. And the first, the orbit, oh, sorry, the object is named by the year it's then given a letter code based upon when it's discovered. So A 
is the first two weeks of January, B is the second half of January, and so on. And then every asteroid discovered in that gets a letter. So like the first one is an A, the second one discovered is a B, so on through Z, and then you go back to A1. So that's how you know that like 1997 XF11 has, you know, it was discovered towards the end of the year. It was, uh, well, I don't know, 11, it, <laughs> it was like the 300th object discovered uh, in the, towards the end of November. So it was a, you know, there was a lot discovered at that time. Anyway, so to go from that to a proper designation and something you can name, you have to observe the asteroid on multiple passes, right? So this is the Earth's orbit and this is your asteroid. Now the asteroid is moving more slowly, so maybe the Earth moves all the way around, and then by the time it's got to here, the asteroid is perhaps has moved ahead. So perhaps the Earth gets to here and then the asteroid is there. Two, uh, a year and a half later. That's called an opposition. So this is opposition when it's opposite the sun. This two, they're opposite the sun. So that's giving you an 18 month time difference. Uh, and that gets you much more accurate orbit. Typically, once you get four oppositions, which could take a decade or so, you are allowed to upgrade your name of your asteroid to a simple number. And the number will be, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Or a great example is 9007. Now, once you have a number, you can give it a name. And 9007 is actually called James Bond. <laughs> it's very rare for fictional characters to be allowed, but, uh, um, well, it's actually, there's a whole bunch of rules involved. It, James Bond is special because it has a space in it. Pardon. So, that's how you discover these things. How do you know that the asteroid you have found is not the same as something that someone has previously found? Well, as I said, you predicted an orbit and you predicted where it would be to get your opposition value and then you predicted another opposition and so on and so forth. Well, asteroid orbital mechanics work in reverse. You can take this orbit and you can project it backwards in time. And you might project it backwards in time and say, hey, you know, a decade ago, somebody found an object and they photographed it, but they didn't get enough data to get a proper orbit. Uh, so this is a rediscovery. If you predict back to someone else's matching result, and it's very easy to check that something isn't a known object, but it might be a previously observed object that didn't have good data. So that would be a rediscovery. And there's two really good examples of rediscovery that I like to talk about. So um, one example, is an asteroid called Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S, named for the Greek messenger god. That's like a, the, the Greek version of Ver, uh, Mercury, pardon me. So it had a, well, if you imagine this is the orbit of Venus, and this is the orbit of Mars, and this is not to scale by any means. The orbit of Hermes, from its one observation, would put it as a Mars crosser and a Venus crosser. In 1937, it flew past the Earth really closely. It had the highest angular velocity of any asteroid observed at the time. It, but because it was so fast, it was only observed for a very short period. So although we got an approximate orbit, we couldn't get an accurate enough orbit to make it a fully fledged asteroid. But because it was so close and so fast, they gave it the name of Hermes. It wasn't until 2002 that somebody else found an object and they predicted its orbit back and they found that in 1937 it would have passed the Earth really closely and that was Hermes. So the other one I'd like to talk about is, oh, has a less, has a more, uh, has a less mythical name let's see. <laughs> and I don't actually know the orbit it's on. It was called 1998 um, OX4, right? 1998 OX4, so it was discovered about halfway through 1998, right? That's what the name tells you. It was near Earth and it was observed for nine days, right? So we got a little bit of an orbit and predicted the orbit forwards, 
Predicting the orbit forwards had an interesting property based on the range of predictions. And remember, there was a number of different solutions that could satisfy the observations. Some of the predictions had hitting the Earth in the future. The problem was this was only discovered after it had been lost. It was a very faint object that was only seen for nine days. So uh, it had gone so far out that no telescope could see it because it was so faint. But there was some concern because yes, it could hit the Earth. So what do you do? Well, a guy called Andrea Milani came up with the notion of virtual impactors. And what that said was, well, we don't know where it could be. You know, we might have to cover this whole section of the sky, which is too much given the, the faintness of the object. But let's just look for the ones, for the orbits that could hit the Earth. And, you know, in that case, it turned into a much smaller section of the sky. Instead of saying, oh, it could be somewhere between here and here, they say if it was going to hit the Earth, it would be somewhere between here and here. And they could cover that section of the sky and look for it. Now, they did that. They went and made the predictions. They looked in that section of the sky and they did not find it. Now, not discovering it, therefore proved that it wasn't on a course to hit the Earth. And that, in itself, was a non-discovery, but it was a very useful non-discovery. So that's Asteroid Discovery. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.